It's just so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Living Easy Podcast. This is Lindsay Maestas, and today I'm here with Dave Hollis. We are recording right around the holidays, and so it's a very sweet time. Um, Dave, how are your preparations and planning going for Christmas? So far, so good. I mean, like, it's really interesting because this is my third Christmas post-divorce, mm. which makes... The planning as a dad of four kids, a thing that's a little bit different than what it looked like before divorce. Yeah. Um, we do two weeks, like we're normally week on, week off, but two weeks before and two weeks after Christmas, we give each other some space for time with family and travel and mm -hmm. all the things. So the house and the decorations and everything, of course, done very early December, in part because my kids, I saw them for the last time on Monday morning when I dropped them off at school as they then are jumping into their two weeks with mom, excited yeah. for the adventure that, you know, that, that comes with. And then I will see them on the 26th for my two weeks and okay. a return to the house that now will be full of presents when they walk back okay. in and uh, the New Year's celebration and everything else. So um, it's different, mm -hmm. to be honest. And it's... Um, it's a thing. It's funny. I put up a post when I took a picture with them on our last full day together where I'd referenced that it gets better. So if anyone who's listening is in the earlier stages of Christmas becoming something that's mm -hmm. different, I definitely like am more adjusted three Christmases in than I was two than I was one. Um, it doesn't make it easy necessarily. Like I miss my kids. I will uh, miss not having them on Christmas morning, but it is something that just becomes the new normal and a thing that you adjust to it. Now like, I'm looking for the silver linings that come in a couple of weeks worth of time yeah. where I have the freedom to travel and connect with my fam. I'm, I'm going to golf with my dad a lot in <laughs> weeks worth of time. And I'm super excited about that. He's super excited about it. So yeah. um, we are ready for Christmas over here. It's just a little yeah. bit different than it was. Well, it's so cool. You bring that up. Cause that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I come from a divorced home. My parents got divorced when I was four. My dad was an international, is an international pilot. And so my schedule was always 15 days with my mom. And then really just any days my dad could be home. I was with him because he was, his schedule was so wonky and crazy. Um, and so the holidays always look different and a little chaotic for us as kids. So I kind of love, I mean, I know that it's hard, I'm sure to be away from family during that time, but we did like the 23rd was an extended family Christmas. 24th was this Christmas, 25th was, and it felt super kind of just chaotic and a little bit overwhelming to where we didn't fully get to enjoy it. And as a kid, of course you love having multiple Christmases, but I think splitting it kind of in the way that you are to where it's like, okay, then you come to dad's house and you can just chill and relax a little bit. And then we go and do our things. Um, but I, I wanted to dig into that with you because I do think that's an audience that maybe I haven't spoken to enough. And as a child from a divorced home, you know, I've, I've felt the separation. And I think as a kid, you really see your parents as impenetrable. You don't see the impact. You're like, oh, they're fine. And sometimes I would blame them for the feelings that I had about the divorce, but you guys are walking through it yourselves. So Sorry, guys, I'm sick. So you're going to hear me a little rough around the edges today. <laughs> oh, man. Forgive me. <laughs> I'm pushing through. Um, but yeah, but I just wanted to hear your perspective a little bit with how in those first few years, your separation from Rachel, how did that maybe the first year, how did that impact you? And what was maybe the most shocking part to you? that you had to navigate through? Well, the first year we did Christmas together. And that was more than anything, this attempt to try and um, really ease our kids into yeah. the disruptive forces that are divorce. Mm -hmm. And it was not ideal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was yeah. like, there was just so much raw emotion in having to try and kind of release ourselves. Well, I just, I'll speak for myself. Like it was really hard for me to know that so many of the traditions that had existed inside of those 16 years of us being married were now not necessarily going to be the traditions of what was moving forward. Yeah. And I think I, you know, like that first Christmas for, for me, I was really grasping at like, well, what, 
like, what can I do to create new traditions? But I was also like working against a lot of um, just sadness. I mean, like I was just, it, I just was, I was in a sad grief of what was kind of mm -hmm. state. And so the idea of having to like generate the energy to build something new, um, it just felt hard. It felt yeah. hard. Yeah. The second holiday was the one where it was like, okay, we're not going to do this as a crew. We're going to do this individually. We're going to split our time in the same way that we're splitting our time this year. And so it fell on me to do something that I'll be honest, wasn't really my, my kind of spiritual gifting. Like I was not the, um, the idea person around tradition as much as she had been the idea person around tradition. And I mean, I loved the traditions. It was great, mm -hmm. but like, it wasn't my idea to put a pot on the stove with potpourri and turn yeah. it on December first and have it smell. Like you know, it just it was more my, practical than creative. A little more practical. Yeah. Like, yep, I'll go get the tree. I'll set that baby up. I'll hang the lights. <laughs> like you know, I was a little bit more of a to do list person to make the traditions come to life. Sure. And finding myself kind of like at the beginnings of creating tradition in that first year that we were doing it separately, our second Christmas after divorce. Um, I'll be honest, it was, it, it felt sad mm -hmm. because I, the, the turning point in my own kind of grieving journey of divorce was when I was able to recognize that the thing I was grieving was the way I wish things had worked out or the idealized version of what I thought was going to happen sure. instead yeah. of like a real practically honest assessment of what wasn't really working or where we actually were. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of Christmas season, I think I was still kind of grieving the way I wish a Christmas morning would feel when all four kids would come running to a tree that, you know, was in a house that we were all living in. And so it took a decent amount of work to say, all right, you get to decorate this house however you want. If you want to do a thing on Christmas Eve, that's your choice. If you want to do something different with stockings, it's up to you. And so that Christmas last year was for me, like the first time I'm actually toe dipping into release yourself from the way you thought things were going to work. Yeah. We're not there. They're not mm -hmm. happening that way. Start now figuring out what it is that lights you up, what it is that lights them up and what it is that uniquely makes this house that you inhabit with them magical around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And so this year, I'll tell you, like <laughs> as much as last year may have been sad, this year felt very celebratory because Good. it was the first year that we're repeating a thing that had uniquely existed inside of my half of their homes mm -hmm. and they're excited i'm excited like it doesn't change the fact that there's of course still some emotion that comes up and hey i miss my kids yeah but there is something in like okay i got through that hardest first one i feel good for having made some progress from that hardest first one and now uh, we're building on top of it and it's it feels more exciting it feels like a little bit of that spirit of christmas is back and so um, again, I mean, I, and I say it like, oh, no, I'm not all the way there, mm -hmm. but I'm, I do feel like, man, I'm so much further uh, at peace and excited about what it is this season relative to what it was before. So if you're at the beginning of the journey, you know, I hope that you also find a little tiny bit of hope in the possibility that it is going to get a little bit easier and that you will find your own traditions in your own space. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your vulnerability, Dave. I feel like it's so refreshing, especially to hear from a man's perspective, um, that it's not all peachy keen, you know, cause I think that there is this maybe societal concept or perspective that it's just like, oh, we're just going to move on and, and do our thing and live our lives. But it's the family that you had for 16 years, like that is family. And to move forward from that doesn't mean necessarily, obviously the family is separated, but that the foundation of what was built still remains. And I think that grieving that is very, obviously very natural, but also very challenging and difficult. Um, and you mentioned your spiritual gifting, and I would just be curious to hear if you don't mind sharing kind of how this journey has affected your faith maybe from the separation to being a single dad to being on a public platform how has it impacted your faith and how do you feel that you're reflecting that to your children yeah that is a good question i think the headline is i don't know that i've ever been closer to god until um our divorce mm -hmm. <laughs> in that um 
there were so few things that made sense. And there were so few things that were normal after that process began that I had to find whatever few remaining constants were going to be steady, irrespective of conditions. Mm -hmm. And like my love for my kids and my proximity to God ended up being kind of two of the things of mm -hmm. the few things that felt like um, I could rely on and count on. There's a verse, James 4, 8. Um, when you draw near to God, he draw near, draws near to you. Mm -hmm. And there were plenty of times, especially just in the uh, most immediate aftermath of divorce, where there was deep, deep sadness. Then there was unbelievable upset. <laughs> like, why God? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I think I underestimated the capacity that God has to hold space for all of our emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, if you get really upset with God and you want to go out into nature and scream into the sky, I can personally attest that he can handle it. Yeah. And um, there was so, so there was something in kind of being forced in some ways to my knees. Divorce is a very humbling experience mm -hmm. um, and being forced to my knees that I, I think I, I developed a little bit of a, 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 a richer and deeper frequency and experience with God because of almost necessity, right? Like I needed God in a way that I hadn't maybe needed in before. I've lived a good life, a privileged life in many, many ways. This was the hardest thing I'd ever been through. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to turn to and lean on God in that hardest time um, was super important. What I think has maybe been more interesting, not more, but like differently interesting in my faith journey in the aftermath of divorce, I would have, shoot, I would have fought for the rest of my life to try and keep our marriage together and what I don't think I had an appreciation for, and I, d I don't think you have appreciation for when hard things happen, is how um, in time you get the perspective that only comes because of that passage. And um, I was able to see that, man, there were plenty of things that I'd been praying for that were delivered in, in because of divorce, not in spite of, but because of the way that having to go through this hard thing having to kind of step outside of the relationship, having to figure some stuff out on my own. And I think it's interesting that, you know, like I've been a person that's prayed my whole life. I've um, been frustrated when prayer hasn't been answered. And I think that, you know, maybe more than anything I've learned in the last couple of years that um, just because you're a fervent prayer or that you pray all the time or what, whatever it ends up being, it doesn't mean that you get a choice in how your prayers get answered. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes going through hard things or going through things that don't make sense or going through things that um, that are humbling or make parts of what you knew of yourself die so that you can be reborn, um, it is still a faithful act of prayer being answered. It's just not actually being answered the way that you would have liked because mm -hmm. it's hard or inconvenient or it hurts. It's uh, answered later than you wanted. Yeah, it's a yeah. delayed answer. Like there's such an instant gratification kind of thing that exists, mm -hmm. I think, for most of us in this day and age that when we pray and we don't get immediate results, it's like, is God even listening? What's even going on here? But um, I don't know. There's so much good that exists in my life. So many things that I have des like desired or, or wanted, prayed to God for that came in part because of having been humbled or having had parts of my identity or parts of whatever it was, ego, other things die. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about this, but there's, you know, there's the story of the Bible of Lazarus who only has a story that matters because he had to die to make the story a thing. Yeah. And when I was, you know, in the midst, just in the thick of processing divorce, I, I had to ask myself after having read this thing about Lazarus, like, well, what else in my life might have to die mm -hmm. so that I might be brought back to life? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, at the time, but fortunately, in that, in you know today's looking back on it, a ton of things had to die. Identity had to die. Ego had to die. A sense of normalcy had to die. My comfort had to die. But they all died for good. They died so that I could be brought back with a cleaner slate, a nicer, you know, tended to foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't mean those deaths don't hurt. They do. Um, but they were necessary because it was a pruning. It was a, you know, it was a thing that was necessary to happen so that I could come out the other side. I mean, a doorbell in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> what? Okay. It's real life. What? Do you want to check it? What universe are we operating here, guys? Come Christmas on. Christmas gifts. <laughs> Christmas gifts. Um, no, but sometimes things have to die and we don't like death. 
we don't like things changing from what they were to what maybe feels like the unknown because it's scary and it's different. Mm -hmm. But so much growth came because of those deaths. So I now can look back with some gratitude for things happening as they did, even if I didn't like them happening the way they did. Mm. That's really good. Thank you. I I feel, as you mentioned, the death, I mean, especially with Lazarus, it's such a good analogy because I think as we see, even the rich man, you know, Jesus says, leave everything and follow me. And it's not necessarily that he cares that he has good things and that he has money. It's not a sin to have money. It's what comes first in the heart. And I think, as you mentioned, when we have that comfortability in our lives, and this is something God's just been teaching me so much lately, is that idolatry of comfort really leads to so much stagnancy sometimes. And as you said, that the pain of it, it's not something you would ever ask for, just like Job, he would never ask for everything to be stripped, but his heart was tested. And it sounds, Dave, like your heart has really been tested as all of ours are just in different capacities in different ways, but to break that idolatry of comfort and to say, okay, God, everything that I knew is stripped from me. Everything that has defined me, as you mentioned, your identity, everything that has defined me has been stripped from me. And so what is left and it's rebuilding and growing in that knowledge of really who Jesus calls you to be. And so what a massive experience to have, not only as an individual, but also publicly, um, especially with your children. Like, do they know you do social media? Do they know what dad does? Like, do they understand? And is it crazy to them? Did they experience the, the rocky places when the divorce happened or like, how have you worked through that with your kids being a public yeah, figure? I mean, number one, if anyone is uh, tempted to become a public figure, don't, don't do don't. it. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's such a strange thing. Like I didn't set out to become, a, and, and public even feels like to, giving me too much credit. I'm like a, a, a kind of public person, a semi, barely. You're, you're known. You're known. <laughs> yeah. Well, irrespective. Um, it yeah. wasn't a thing that was like an intentional, like, oh yeah, let's, let's go do this. It just kind of happened over time. But um, yeah, going through a divorce publicly, going through anything uh, that, you know, you wish uh, you hadn't done or said, like, I made plenty of mistakes. Mm. And um, it's already hard enough to go through divorce, then layering, you know, when you layer being a public figure and having people um, kind of weighing in on their thoughts on you choosing to get divorced or not choosing to get divorced or how you announce the divorce or what the divorce means. Um, you know, it just, it was the worst. I mean, like truly the worst, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, you just have to kind of tune out the noise. Because yeah. on the one hand, everyone is absolutely, they are so entitled to their opinion and they don't actually know me. They don't know Rachel. They don't know right. our family. They don't, they don't know our hearts. They don't, they don't know anything I, respectfully. I mean, like I love the community of people that I've spent time with. And also if someone was like upset or surprised or hurt by the news of our divorce, I promise that uh, it doesn't compare to the kind of pain that we were experiencing inside of it. Right. Um, but we, you know, also are making choices and decisions in our life that are going to make our lives better. And mm -hmm. as much as I didn't see it at the time, I will confess, um, I know for sure today that I am a better, stronger person who is more equipped to fully actualize why God put me on this planet outside of my marriage. Mm -hmm. And so is she. And that is great because it means that our kids get the very best versions of each of us in a way that they maybe wouldn't have had if we mm -hmm. had just stayed married. So like my kids are the beneficiaries of a thing that of course was hard for them, um, but they're so well adjusted and are so happy in spite of some of what had they had to go through yeah. um in part because they just get a better version of each of their parents um they have, i think are you know aware <laughs> on some level of like hey yeah you guys have written books or you have some kind of profile um i have you know i've i've tried to step back as much as i can in being as public because there are plenty of things that come in being a public person that um they can be good, uh, but I, I could identify plenty of things about being a public person that brought out some of the worst parts of me. Yeah. And so um, I, I I still do, you know, I do, I do my own podcast and have, you know, an ambition to write some more things, but 
social media in and of itself is a it's a tricky bit of business mm -hmm. because um, if you live by the praise, you will die by the criticism. Mm -hmm. and there are plenty of critics out there, mm -hmm. and they again have every right to be critical. But I found sometimes that the way that I felt good about myself when I was getting cheers or the way that I felt bad about myself when I was being criticized was uh, uh, a sign that I probably needed to spend a little less time being public. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I feel a lot better about um, getting to a place where when I'm having a good day, it's because I can take pride in having kept promises to myself or, you know, showing up the way that I've suggested I want to do in a way that makes me feel aligned. And if I'm having a hard day, it probably means that I broke a promise to myself or I didn't keep, you know, on, on, on the right track. And not that it was because somebody said something nice to me <laughs> online yeah. or somebody said uh, something that was, uh, was meant to make me feel like crap online. Okay. It was just because, Hey, I, I, I'm either in or out of integrity with myself. So um, I don't know, public, public stuff is so weird. I personally feel like it feels really invasive. And I think more than ever, because I think it feels invasive to the, to the limit you allow it to be invasive. And I think that that's where a lot of lines have to be drawn to where, at least for myself, I'm always telling my husband, like, I have these moments that I feel like I should be sharing because it would draw an engagement or it's something that people want to see, or they've told me they want to see. But for me, I'm like, gosh, yes, I have this, but equally, I want to have my privacy. Like I want, and, and I don't have a quarter of the platform that you have, but it's like, I want my, my own level of privacy with my family that while yes, maybe teaching on this subject to my audience would be great equally. Like I never want to forsake the closeness of the relationship with the people who are actually in my home for people that I've never met. And similarly, it's like, I appreciate my community so much but I, again, cannot forsake what God has placed in the four walls of my home for that. And, and very similarly, I actually had a conversation with Matthew West on this topic, and he talked really heavily about that struggle that he faced with the constantly seeking that praise. And I told my husband one day, I'm like, you know, what? I didn't even really think about it, but sometimes I'll get on. And if I see like a good amount of views or virality or something it completely shifts the way that I treat my family versus if something did really poorly. And that's yeah. when I had to come to a place where I'm like, I got to wipe my hands of this a little bit and pass some things off because it's just, it's like at the end of my, and I always talk about this on the podcast, but at the end of our lives, we're not going to be looking back at social media. And I think a lot of people used to look back and say, I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. I wish I would have spent more time at home. And I think now the end of our lives is going to be, I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time on my phone. Like I wish I would have seen the people in front of me and looked in their eyes rather than scrolling through the lives of people I'll never meet. So, um, yeah, yeah I just well, appreciate that. I just, I just did this. Uh, I mean, like if I didn't know what I was getting into, don't know that I would have signed up for it. I did a physique competition, like bodybuilding okay. competition. I mean, what are we even doing Good here? <laughs> it was amazing. But, uh, when I first started, I was like, you know what, I'm going to document this journey because it's like, it was a six month thing. I had to commit to like really disciplined workout, really disciplined, disciplined diet. I had never gone to a, like a stage like this, where I'd be flexing muscles in front mm -hmm. of people who are judging. It feels even odd saying it out loud. And yet here I was going to embark on this because I like the idea of trying to do something that felt bigger than a thing I could handle. And I actually was encouraged like, hey, if you really put your mind to this and you really do it, you're going to see some transformation. Uh, I thought it was going to be more physical transformation, way more mental transformation. Yeah, but cool. so I got a video person to record the first like week, six months prior to the show. And he recorded it and my fear kicked in and I was like, oh, my goodness, what if I don't what if I don't stick with it? What if I like, what if I start putting content out and then I don't like do well? What Follow if, like, through. whatever? Yeah. So I didn't document it. And that I tell you that because I learned something in not documenting it that was not the reason why I wasn't documenting. I got to the like week of the perform of the performance of the, the competition and I had not yet 
shown almost any pictures of any part of the journey. It was a thing that I was doing for me. For yourself, and the, way yeah. making, the way it was making me feel about myself for having committed to something and been really, really disciplined. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever been this disciplined in my entire life. Good for you. And it was hard. It was yeah. really hard, but I was like, the thing I felt for myself was dignity and pride for like just keeping my word. But I got done and I showed the before after picture and it's, you know, impressive. Mm -hmm. But I haven't really talked about one of the biggest takeaways was that I realized that so many of the things that I had done as the semi-public figure were performative, mm -hmm. right? Like I was doing this thing, not so that I would necessarily feel a certain way about myself, but so that in performing that thing, it might draw engagement or it might encourage other people or it might, there were some things that were positive hopes, but there were some things that were selfish hopes. Like, oh, I hope that this draws more audience or I hope this makes them you know, be, feel more engaged or makes them wanna buy something like a book that I might put out, whatever. But I, when I, I kind of like sat with it and realized like, my goodness, like how many times has like there been a performative part of me in this curated, not real world of social media that actually wasn't them getting to see a perfect reflection of me, but the version of who I think I need to be to be yeah. liked by them. Mm. Good. And I was like, oh, geez, like there's too many times to count. And if mm -hmm. anybody goes on social media, for the most part, you're putting up a version of who you think other people want to see. Mm -hmm. There is performance in it in and of itself and part of like what came in that recognition was every time that I'm doing something out of a performative motivation, on some level, I am suggesting that if I were to just be myself, that I wouldn't be enough, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be loved or I wouldn't be liked or I wouldn't be accepted. I wouldn't be in the in group. And so it has had me having to like really spend time thinking like, okay, if I'm going to go on social, it's going to be because I just want to show a normal glimpse at me and not some highlight reel version, not some performing version, not some, and it's like, I think all of us as humans, whether it's ego driven or fear driven or whatever, that's a hard thing to, to do in part because we've been programmed for so long since social media has come out to only do it in a way that will tip the scales into people liking versus criticizing the thing that we put up. Yeah. So I just, I just haven't been as engaged because it's really hard to just do it when you're feeling it and not thinking that it's because of wanting to perform for other people. Yeah. And like kind of selling yourself. Do you mind if I ask, are you in counseling or therapy or have you all ever the, done it? All the time for okay. like 15 years. Yeah. Okay. Good for you. And I ask yeah. that because, um, the way that you speak, I feel like it just sounds, I mean, a lot of emotional intelligence, you seem extremely uh, like self-aware. And um, one of the things that I've been navigating personally is sense of self and realizing, and I wanted to ask you this, um, kind of realizing that maybe along the way I've been doing this for about seven years now, but along the way that there's been a loss of sense of self because it's performative to where you're putting yourself out for the sake of responses. And you're like, okay, well, you're, you're manipulating, not manipulating, but almost manipulating things to make sure that they're likable or that they're approachable or they're relevant or relatable. Do you feel that your sense of self has shifted? And maybe within the last year, it sounds like there's just been a lot of healing that's happened that maybe you've found more of that. And if so, what is that? Who is Dave? Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's a perpetual journey still yeah. on closer now than I've been, but I mean, to answer the initial question, of course, because it, like there is something, unfortunately in anything public that you, you become trained, you understand what people like and don't like and what they respond to and don't respond to. And so you, um, you can't help, but kind of go back to the well of what works mm -hmm. when you're trying to engage in whatever else. But it's like, I'm at a friend's house right now mm -hmm. and the almost the, the immediate reaction that she had when we first met was, you're nothing like you, uh, <laughs> you're nothing like I thought you would be. I'm yeah. like, what? How dare you? <laughs> um, you know, like I, there's probably parts of my humor that I edit <laughs> in certain yeah. 
parts of social media. And censor. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, I censor, right? Because it's like it's not totally, not everything's appropriate. And like I, I'm, I'm just like I'm a kid at heart, and I have a lot of fun. And also, um, I'm trying, like at the time, like certainly when I have a book you know, coming out or something like that, like I'm trying to navigate, like how do you position yourself as a person that someone would want to read a book from? And what I've realized is like, I, I've become friends with Mel Robbins. She is like mm-hmm. one of the greatest human beings on the planet for a single reason. And that is, she is the same person on the phone, in a living room, online, on a stage, like there is nothing that ever changes. Yeah. And so in this work that I'm doing to both understand who I am, but also love myself, the times when I don't like myself, it's when I have deviated from who I know myself to be to try and make somebody else happy, like me, push a like button, say a nice thing on a con- like anytime there's any dissonance between who I know myself to be and how I'm actually showing up because of hoping to get love. I like myself less because I've tried again. It's like get back to what I was saying before. I train myself that if I were to just be myself, I wouldn't be liked. I wouldn't be accepted. I wouldn't be commented about in the way that you'd hope to be. Mm-hmm. And so I have been very much on this journey of like, okay, really understanding who am I and how, like, what would it mean? Like, what would I, like, how can I put at risk rejection for being myself all the time and becoming so comfortable with being rejected by the people who I'm not meant for, for the benefit of being able to love myself since in that state, I would just be showing up as me over and over again in a way that says, this is me unapologetically here I am. And I hope, I hope that you like me. And if you don't, I, I'm just so at peace with loving myself that it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Mm-hmm. Closer to it. Mm-hmm. Not there yet. Yeah. That's really good. I randomly, I know this isn't totally related, but I watched the Dolly Parton interview. Um, she was getting grilled and she was younger, but her, the only thing that remained consistent throughout the interview, they were just really, really leaning into like how fake she looked or how whatever. And she was so solid in her sense of self that she just, she'd say, you know, they probably do say those things about me. They probably do think those things about me, but I am so confident in just who I've been made to me that I'm okay with it, you know? And it was just really refreshing to see because sometimes it's, it's the shifting or the moving things around in order to fit a certain perspective or a certain um, standard that is really suffocating. So, okay. Yeah. By the way, I mean, like for, for anybody who suffers from this kind of feeling, like, it all goes back to something, right? Like I grew up in a very religious household. There was very much a right and wrong. And Mm -hmm. there was very much, um, there was a little bit of, you know, I'm one of four kids. My my parents are so great, but my experience in receiving love usually came through achievement. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. when I was valedictorian or when I memorized enough Bible verses or scored Mm -hmm. enough goals or whatever it might be, then I was the recipient of the love I desired most from the people I craved it from most. Mm -hmm. And though the intent, like there was never intention of like, oh, we're going to create a transactional love model for Dave Mm -hmm. to have to work against for the rest of his life. It's just the model that I grew up with. Yeah. And so as time went by, man, it was an awesome catalyst for growing a great career inside of entertainment. I had a a ton of fun Mm -hmm. growing and I pushed myself and my push for a, a better salary or for a better title or for more access or joining boards or whatever. A lot of times it was driven by that same thing. All right. When you got that title or when you make this money or when you're in that room, you'll be loved. Hmm. And that's great until you realize the double-edged side of that sword is you're already loved and you've created now this contingency that means when you don't have the title or don't have the status or the relationship ends or whatever, you don't get the likes on Facebook, Mm -hmm. um, then you will deem yourself to be unlovable because you've been programmed to believe that you're achieving or getting access or whatever is the way to love. So my work has been like, okay, I've got all this programming even if it came from people who had the greatest of intentions from me, it still exists. And I'm trying to put a firmware update into my software so I can change the way that I think about needing to do or be or achieve or shape shift myself in any kind of way to be lovable and worthy and Mm. good. Mm. 
We have similar backgrounds, it sounds like. And one thing I would ask you is how have you shifted that now as a dad to where you don't do the same thing? Like, what are some practical things that you've implemented? Because I know you've done the work. And I think when you assess yourself and realize, okay, I was raised that way, I need to do the work to not allow that to be part of my children's childhood, um, even though your parents did the best that they could. What are some things that you've done to shift that in your home? Well, I mean, the first, I, the like incoming bad assumption that I had as a dad to be was that I would have the same kind of parenting approach to all of my children because that's just the way it is. And I just, I think I had an assumption that I had a great dad. My dad must've been the same great dad to all four kids that I grew up with, or my mom was great. All four kids have the same mom. And that's crazy because each of my kids are wildly different. Mm -hmm. They're just the most different people. They have yeah. the same parents. They are the most different people. <laughs> And so part of it was um, releasing any expectation that the way I experienced childhood would be the way they experienced childhood. It doesn't mean that there aren't some standard rules and some respect and boundaries. And, you know, there are some things that are constant. Doesn't matter if you're different or not. We're going to uh, make sure that we are kind people in this world. But, um, you know, understanding their individual love languages or whether they're more, you know, uh, introvert or extrovert, or if they are someone who needs more quality time, or if they need someone to go out and whatever. I want to try and meet my kids as much as I can where they are, have them feel seen and celebrated for who they are, and pour whatever kind of time that we spend with each other individually into things that take their passion and take it to the next level. And so understanding those that like the individual nuances of each of the kids that I have and trying to encourage them to be their most awesome version of themselves without creating too sturdy a definition of what awesome is like awesome for me is different than awesome for Jackson is different than awesome for Sawyer is different than awesome for Ford and Noah defines awesome for all <laughs> of us because she's in charge at the house but the, like the headline is Everyone, everyone's definition of like who they are. I want them to feel seen, supported, and loved for who God individually created each of them to be. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that frees them a little bit for feeling like they have to become something to be seen as love or yeah. love. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think what it also does is really sounds like you're preventing comparison competition between the siblings as well, because that favoritism can be real in some families to where they feel like they have to level up to meet that, um, to get to that place of love that the other sibling is. But when you're accepting them and seeing them as an individual and, and fostering that individuality rather than trying to fit them into a mold. I feel like you give them all freedom as siblings to love one another more. So I think that's really sweet. And you mentioned Noah. So I want to get to that. Um, you and Noah, you have your new book, Here's to Your Dreams, A Tea Time with Noah. So I want to hear a little bit about this. I know that you guys had your tea times and that's morphed into a book. So talk a little bit about kind of the premise of this book and how much Noah had to do with writing it. Right on. So interestingly, so I wrote this book uh, back in 2020. It came out called Get Out of Your Own Way. As I'm in the final stages of writing the book, I have this like moment where as a person who didn't grow up reading personal development books and has been skeptical in some ways of what personal de development even means or why it exists, I realized that like as I have this book that had 20 chapters, each chapter was a lie that I had believed, whether it was sold to me by bad programming or society or something, I believed a lie in believing it, I got in my way. And now the book was going to show you some of the truth that I found in making mistakes to make the lie unbelievable. I realized that, man, I got these kids and in particular, this two-year-old daughter at the time. And she's going to grow up and the world is going to tell her a bunch of lies that is yeah. going to make her second guess her worthiness and her goodness and her ability to believe in herself. And if I could sit with her and start instilling capital T truth with her in a fun way that didn't feel like, you know, the learning was medicine, then maybe she'd grow up and not need to buy a stinking book in a personal development section of a bookstore. <laughs> I want to make the books I was writing obsolete for my kids. Yeah. So we started doing that fun video shooting thing and, you know, trying to distill super elevated personal development concepts for adults to 
two-year-old learning level is so as cool. ridiculous and hilarious as <laughs> you might think, but I'm trying to instill belief and reframe failure and the belief in dream and everything else was just part of what we started doing week over week. And at a certain point, the publisher reached out and was like, hey, people really like these silly videos of you and your yeah. daughter doing these things. What do you think about putting a book together? And so it took a couple of years, but it was the most incredible process because mm -hmm. every single step of the way, like, all right, it's time to write the story. What story should we write? And we sat yeah. down and we started just like having the coolest conversation as collaborators in vision casting, what a story could look like. And as we had some different illustrators that the team wanted us to pick from, like, they we sent out books that were our favorite books to read at night to the team and then they found illustrators that illustrated in a way that looked kind of like the books that we loved yeah and we got to choose from people drawing pictures of us in their own style and um just the like the ability to work with one of your kids is a treat that i would hope anyone who's listening gets the chance to experience but um there was a pride that she was able to, to see the day the book came, there we are, drawn on the front cover. Mm -hmm. um, there was a pride that she had in having participated in something that I like wish every five-year-old could have. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of believing in yourself or loving yourself enough to believe in yourself and the idea that you have permission to dream as big as your brothers do or whatever it might end up being, um, the pride that she had for getting to work on the project now sits as this foundational block that her self-worth and her self-love will get to springboard from. Like a cool, uh, like real tangible capture of a memory for us, you know, taking the, the experiences that we had at our little tea table and now putting it into a book. Like it, it's a cool like legacy piece for what, for me, is just like some of the, like the richest time I've ever had as a dad. Wow. Well, I can see it. You literally light up as you talk about her, like the, the energy. <laughs> I mean, you've had great energy the whole time, but you can just sense the energy is so different when you speak about her in this. And so that's just, it's really cool to see a father love his daughter so well, but also to include her in something that's so pivotal for her, for a sense of accomplishment and a sense like that feeling of finishing something, but also with her daddy, I'm sure is just a really big deal for her. So how has she responded? Like as everything's come out, how is she acting? Oh my <laughs> gosh. Like she, I mean, like, it's the best, I, I, I actually, like, I didn't know how engaged she was going to want to be. I didn't know how excited she was or wasn't going to be. So I, I'm very much a, like, manage your expectations as low right. as possible and then be pleasantly surprised. Like, she woke up every single day asking, <laughs> as, as we were getting close to the release of the book, can we sign some more books? <laughs> who, who did the book? Like, <laughs> when, when I did that fitness competition, it was a couple weeks before the book had come out. And there were some autographed copies that Noah and I signed that were being given away each day in the couple of weeks leading up. Well, we, we, she, I, the competition was in Arizona. So I, I flew the kids out to be able to see the competition. We went to dinner afterwards. And in walking into this restaurant, a woman recognized us and oh. came up and said, and I, now, so I'm standing off to the side and Noah at the time is standing with one of my sons and Heidi and this woman comes up and is like, I bought your book. Now, I didn't hear her say it. Yeah. Noah comes sprinting across this <laughs> cheesecake factory to where I am, you know, maybe 20 yards away. Daddy, she bought our book. Like, Aww. she's just like so excited. I was like, I wish I could get that excited about one person buying a book. This would <laughs> change my entire life. Keep this energy, woman. This is yeah. so good. But she just but it made just, it reality uh, for her, right? Oh, yeah. Like it made it reality to where she's like, I see a face of someone who's actually recognized and experienced what I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's it was it, it has been so cool. I mean, of course, my 10-year-old Ford. <laughs> we're like celebrating the day that the book comes out. And he's like, All right, now you know, we did those videos called Ford for Thought. What do you think about a kid's version uh, book of Ford for Thought? Like, right, Ford, I like where your head's at. We need a publisher to actually want to make a Ford yeah. for Thought, but I like where you're going here, buddy. How cool. I, That's so, so awesome. I so, mean, so the example that you're setting, I know that, I mean, I, I think that there's this realm of like, for me, having been in social media and I don't want my kids anywhere near it, but then equally, 
you see the amount of opportunity that stems from things like this and, and just for them to be able to see you not only with the book, but I love like with the fitness challenge, because that discipline, as you mentioned, it's such an emotional strength that it oh. gives to you like 75 hard. I've never completed it one day, <laughs> one day I'll follow through with finishing, but even just, you know, like I've done whole 30 before. And when I finish, I, I just feel this sense of like, okay, I, I finished what I started. And I feel like that's what Jesus yeah. calls us to like, finish what you start when you begin a task and whether for you, it's a fitness competition or raising your babies or writing books, like you're finishing what you start. And it's such a beautiful example to the kids that you have in your life. So I just yeah. By really the way, cool. it is like, if you're like, I don't love myself. Well, number one, you're in a lot of good company, unfortunately, because I think self-love is like an epidemic issue. Yeah. But if you want to get closer to loving yourself, if you want to actually love yourself, the like simplest way is to finish what you've suggested you're, you're going to. Like keeping your promises is the vehicle for dignity and respecting yourself. And if you say you're going to do something, like, I think a lot of us, like, I'm sure you can relate to this. Like, I, you know, you keep your word to a whole bunch of other people, making sure that you're going to keep your kids or your partner, your, your friends, whatever, like you wouldn't show up late to that for them. You wouldn't, you know, wouldn't like, you know, not show up to a date that you suggested. If you said you're going to pick them up, you're mm -hmm. going to pick them up. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to you keeping promises to yourself, <laughs> we're the worst. We're just the worst. Amen. That's no, why you struggle to love yourself is because you've lost trust with yourself. You've, mm -hmm. you know, like broken promises or not kept your words so often that you just don't like the fact that you can't finish what you suggested you would when you start. And, um, but it is just like, man, if there's like a single thing, that's the thing. That was one of the biggest, the biggest things in that stinking fitness competition was, <laughs> I said I was going to do it and I did it and it felt, I felt so good about myself, not for the result. I got, I think I got last place. Like I, mm. <laughs> I'm, they didn't give last place, but I'm pretty sure I got last place. <laughs> and I am so fine with it because I wasn't doing it for a ribbon. I was yeah. doing it so that I could feel something about having just the knowledge that I put maximum effort into something and I finished a thing that I started. Like, it's just mm -hmm. a huge game changer if you are interested in respect and dignity for yourself, which is a vehicle to loving yourself. Mm. Well, and I believe you when you say that, because when you were speaking earlier, you just, you said like, what a significant change it was in you physically and emotionally. And so it wasn't your, you weren't results driven, like you said. And I feel that so often with what we do, I mean, whether it's parenthood or career, or even in marriage, it's like, if only I can get here, if only I could get to this point, if only, but I've been reading this book, Atomic Habits. Have you ever read it? Oh yeah. yeah. So good. And how it talks about that one degree shift that every degree, if you're going on an upwards trajectory, you're progressing, but you don't always see that. And, but if you're going down one degree every day, you're really, really starting to depreciate in your life. Um, I've been watching this show called limitless with Chris Hemsworth on Hulu. Have you seen yeah. it? Yeah. So good. And I feel so like good. kind of what we were talking about, it just made me think of that, the comfortability to where you're pushing yourself out of that zone and allowing yourself into that place where I'm going to pursue something I've never done before, but for our families to see it is just really neat. So anyway, in closing, I, I just really appreciate your honesty and candidness and vulnerability. And I would love to hear for those who are going to read, here's to your dreams, a tea time with Noah. What do you hope that they gain from it? What do you hope that these little kids walk away feeling and experiencing? Well, I hope more than anything, they feel a sense of belief in self. I, you know, like the whole, the whole conceit is that, you know, here's to dreams that you, you ought to dream. You deserve to dream, dream the biggest dreams, mm -hmm. but also um, it's kind of like prayer. <laughs> Um, you can pray all the prayers. Um, the the way that you actually achieve the dream is probably going to be unlike how you think it will go in the same way that the way that the prayer gets answered is probably unlike the way that you wish it were be, would be answered. It's going to be answered the way that it needs to be answered. But, um, you know, it's an adventure of dreaming a big dream 
where we're not, she and I, equipped to actually do the thing that she said she wants to do. She wants to build a big old ship to go sail out on the sea. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't know how to build one. Can't find a ship builder. When we find the materials, we get some of the wrong ones. When we build it, it doesn't float. When we fix it, it finally does. When we get on the water, the conditions of the sea change. Like life will end up coming and doing it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the story is one of ingenuity and stick to and pivoting and learning from failure and getting back up even when you feel discouraged and being open to the possibility that things are going to happen that you can't see and they're happening so that you can become stronger and learn more and grow. Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything, I hope that people walk away with a sense of, man, I didn't even know I was going to take away that I can believe in myself. Um, you know, it's meant to be something that teaches you something, but doesn't taste like medicine. And yeah. I think it's fun in a way that covers up a little bit of the nutritional value. Hopefully people enjoy it, but that they walk away feeling like, man, I can dream. I can believe in myself enough to do it. That's really cool. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I like to end some shows. One, I need to do a little shout out because my cousin Rob, Ashley, and my friend Shana helped prep me for this interview, just in the sense that they were so thrilled that I was talking to Dave Hollis because your books are all over their home. So what? Stop, Ashley and Shana. Those are my favorite people on the dang planet. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yes, thanks. But it was just cool. You know, it's just cool to see the impact that you've had on people. And I think sometimes in the internet world, you don't see faces like your daughter did that day um, of people who just truly genuinely are impacted by the words that you put out and the encouragement that you put out. So just want to say thank you, but also I'd love to do, um, a few likes and dislikes. So easily just three things that you love and three things that you could just completely do without, and it could be anything. All right. I love driving in an open field in my Bronco. Mm. It is like one of the best experiences. It's loud, but it's so <laughs> peaceful. Fun. Um, okay. I love a Sunday after church with football and nothing else. Food and football? Oh yeah, no, there'll be yeah. food. But we don't even care about what the food is because we're just watching <laughs> just the football. Because we're just watching football. Okay. Um, and um, love an experience with my kids. Hmm. Uh, I just I for Thanksgiving. I had them for Thanksgiving and uh, it was just going to be us. And I was like, you know what? We got to do something. So I took them to a little town in Mexico. <laughs> with oh, wow. Some friends. And we had the coolest experience. It was like, it looked like the town, uh, like a town out of Coco. I mean, it was like oh, the coolest, really? like, just off the beaten path town. Yeah. Um, but I, I love an experience with my kids. Just like some kind of like getaway destination -y kind of thing. It was a couple hour flight. We were in a completely different universe, completely different world. Any of the things that mattered in this life, in this world, did not exist for four days for Thanksgiving. It was awesome. That's so cool. Uh, what can I do without? Number one, uh, I can do without my children leaving every single light in the house on when they go to their mom's house. I'm just going to have to ask that we have lights turned off <laughs> when they leave. Uh, what I could do without is damp towels. Mm. Moldy being left on the floor of carpet lined <laughs> closets in children's bedrooms. Oh, okay. It's, Very it's, specific. It's going to be a pass for me because <laughs> it's not just the mildew of the, of the towel. It's now also creating something of a smell on the carpet. And I don't want to have to fix that. Um, and I can do without, I can do without mean people. Mm -hmm. Let's just be nice people. We're recording this just after Twitch took his life. It's like a crazy yeah. thing. It's like, you never, ever, ever know what someone is going through. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really appreciate the times when people tell me that I'm encouraging or uplifting or whatever. And I can tell you like, man, I have, I've like really struggled with darkness and, and, and darker thoughts. Mm -hmm. Not right now in the past mm -hmm. a year ago at this time, I was not in a good spot, not a good spot. And, and what I don't think we appreciate is how, people who are unkind can be a tipping point for someone who's already in a place of just deep, deep despair. And so I just, I can do without unkind people. Yeah. I, yeah. Like I know that people hurt people. I know that there is a reason for their pain manifesting in the way that it does. And I have empathy for them, but man, um, I just, I, I try to create as much 
boundary and space as I possibly can from unkind and mean people because life's already hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That was a shock um, when I saw the Twitch announcement yeah. because I think that, and I think it's been a real shock to a lot of people, similar to Robin Williams, yeah. because you don't see anything. And that's one thing that I'm always telling my friends and my audiences, it's so hard to hate someone up close because when you actually like, I can sit here face to face with you and have a conversation, but when you sit with somebody across from a screen, you know, obviously you have the keyboard warriors and it's so much easier, but when you hear someone's heart, almost anytime you hear someone's heart, you have a sense of empathy and compassion for them. But when we don't give space for that, I feel like just the cruelty, it's really, really, um, manifesting itself into something dark. And so I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. And um, here's the thing too. Like I, I mean, I have served with cherries on top reasons for people to be unkind. Like I get, like I get it. Like I've made plenty of mistakes. Um, and, and it's even like, it feels pandering for me to suggest like, and I'm human, but mm -hmm. like the reality is like anyone who does literally anything and has expressed even like the slightest degree of regret or remorse they're trying to make amends they still they have human feelings and even if you're still upset your decision to be unkind like i don't know you just don't know if you're going to push somebody off the off the ledge anyway it's just um kindness matters just be kind yeah. assume that somebody's going through something because everybody's struggling yeah agreed well, thank you so much, Dave. It's been so nice um, just having real honest conversation. I really appreciate your authenticity. It's very refreshing um, and encouraging. And I think that you're going to bless a lot of people in the holiday season. So for all of you listening, make sure to check out A Tea Time with Noah. You can find it anywhere books are sold. Um, mm -hmm. And then also following Dave on at Mr. Dave Hollis so that you can see more of his experiences and explorations and adventures with his kids and his family. Um, and Dave, just to the audience today, is there anything that you would like to say, I guess, over the holidays, maybe if somebody is feeling just discouraged or broken, what would be your last word of advice to them today? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're going through a hard time right now, number one, I, you know, I'll offer you, <laughs> I'll offer you a prayer. Um, this is the prayer that my mom prayed over me every single night. It's the prayer that I pray over my kids. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Look upon you kindly and give you peace. Mm. I send you a prayer of peace. Um, but I would also say, um, you know, like I, I've had a, a really interesting handful of years here. And I've gone through some things that I like, man, if I had to vote, <laughs> I would have voted against um, having to experience pain or grief or yeah. hard things. Um and I would have done it at the expense of getting to become a stronger version of myself or learn more about myself, maybe more humble version of myself, like a whole bunch of, I think, pretty great things have come because of the hard stuff. And it's, you know, I, I don't know that I loved hearing from people in the midst of the hard stuff that <laughs> I have an appreciation for it when it was over. <laughs> my, grandma, my grandma told me that, you know, God bless her. Grandma Alicia just passed away at 100, but... She had this like conversation with me in the like midst in the depths of the darkness of divorce. It's like, well, I'll tell you, Dave, at a hundred years old, I've gotten, I've seen everything. And every time I've had a hard time, I got through the other side and you're going to get through this too. And like, I'm a channel grandma Lee and just say like, you're going to get through this mm -hmm. and you will as impossible as it sounds right now, you're going to look back and have even just like the tiniest amount of appreciation and gratitude for the way that this crap, this unfair, this hard ended up producing something good in you because mm -hmm. you survived it, because you overcame it, because you were able to push through it. Um, I know that you will. I, like, I'm positive that you will. Um, and, and as you're able to believe that you will, you'll start seeing evidence of that silver lining stuff around whatever darkness cloud-wise you're working through. And mm. I hope you get to see those silver linings sooner than later. Amen. Well, thank you Amen. so much. It's, it's cool to see your joy. Like it's, it's, it exudes. I'm feeling joyful. It's yeah. Thursday. I'm come on. <laughs> well, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. I hope it is super, super sweet and even sweeter than especially the past two years, but just one of the sweetest that you've ever had. 
And for all of you listening, um, if you enjoy this conversation, make sure to share with friends, family, anybody who could be blessed by this to hear God's word or to hear just the encouragement that Dave has shared today. Make sure to check out a tea time with Noah. And, um, when we just love you guys, we thank you for taking the time to even listen to us, just chitter chatter and have these conversations. And we pray that you have a very, very Merry Christmas and holiday, um, whether you're alone or with family, that you're just able to see the goodness of God in the thick of life and circumstances. So we love y'all. Thank you so much for everything. And we'll see you next Monday on the Living Easy Podcast.